This Parsha podcast is sponsored by my dear friend Jeff Yaris in honor of his wife, Beth, on the occasion of her birthday. And on behalf of the entire Parsha podcast family, we wish her a hearty happy birthday and we wish her many happy returns. If you want to sponsor a podcast in honor of your wife's birthday or for any other reason, please email me, rabbiwolby at gmail.com. This week, we see a nation that undergoes an absolute stunning transformation. The Parsha begins and the nation is in the absolute depths of despair. They've been enslaved for more than a century. They've been subject to oppressive foreign rule for more than two centuries. And things just exacerbated. Previously, they were provided the ingredients, the straw to make the bricks, to fill out their daily quota. And now they have no straw, and they still need to maintain the quota, and they are just in the absolute dumps. And Moshe, per the instruction of God, goes and offers them redemption and salvation, and they are so consumed with their work and misery that they can't even hear him due to shortness of breath. So we begin the Parsha, and the nation is in the absolute nadir of its history. But everything changes quite swiftly and quite permanently. The Parsha begins the year of plagues, 10 devastating plagues that befell the Egyptians, but not the Jews. And this culminates, of course, the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians. We'll read about that in next week's Parsha. And of course, the Exodus. And the Exodus, well, that kid starts 50 dramatic days culminating in the greatest event in all of human history, the revelation at Sinai. And along the way, they have the splitting of the sea, and they start eating manna from heaven, and they have this three-day scare. They go three days without water. They arrive to Marah, and all the water is bitter. And Moshe has shown a stick, which he throws into the water, which sweetens the water. They have the war with the Amalek, and they arrive at the mountain, and they experience national prophecy. They get the Ten Commandments. And they start to get the Torah at Sinai. So there's an amazing transformation that's happening over here. And the question I want to discuss today, ponder about a little bit, is how did this all happen? How did the nation transform so quickly from this lowest point of our history to the absolute peak of any nation, of any people, in any time? That's maybe the story of our Parsha. And I want to suggest a framework of understanding what happened, how this transformation occurred, and then maybe after we have that framework, we could draw out some interesting and maybe also a bit controversial takeaways. So first of all, I think it's a nice idea to point out, a side point, but one that's very comforting and very inspiring. Our sages tell us that the Exodus, when the Jewish people were free from the shackles of Egypt, Well, that's the prototype, that's the blueprint of all future redemptions. And here we see how quickly everything can change. The beginning of the Parsha, the nation can't even hear Moshe's message of redemption. And the end of the Parsha, well, they're underway this most transformational period where they go from being slaves, enslaved, tormented, oppressed, can't even breathe, due to all the work, to leaving per the miracles of God with an outstretched arm, with all these miracles, an incredible transformation. I think people, in my opinion correctly, assess the current state of the nation and they wonder, well, how could it reasonably become a nation that merits redemption and Messiah, rebuilding the temple? We're so far away from that. I think our Parsha, is somewhat comforting. We see how fast things can change. But okay, back to the main question. How did the nation undergo this dramatic and unexpected transformation from the beginning of the parasha to the end of the parasha? Of course, the the story continues in next week's parasha, parasha's bow, where the actual exodus happens. So I want to lay out a framework of understanding what's happening over here. So if you study the Parsha carefully, you'll notice that Pharaoh himself and the Egyptians at large, they too underwent a spiritual transformation as well. When Pharaoh first encounters Moshe and Aaron in last week's Parsha, he says, who is God? Why should I listen? I'm not going to release you. I'm going to make things worse. 
He starts off and he has absolutely no sense of faith in God, of submission to God, and he rebels against the notion of listening to God. I'll make it worse. You think I'll make it better? I'll make it worse. And slowly, over the course of his education, he begins to develop some faith. In fact, Moshe tells him, by the very first play in our Parsha, chapter 7, verse 17, through this you will know that I am Hashem. The Almighty sending you a message, tells Moshe to Pharaoh, that he's in charge and you're going to learn about that. And then when Moshe removes or Moshe prays to remove the frauds, this is chapter 8, verse 6, you will know, you will develop the understanding that there is no one like Hashem, our God. And then, of course, when the magicians and necromancers of Pharaoh cannot replicate the kingdom, the third plate of lice, well, they throw up their hands in submission and they say, Et spalokim, it's the finger of God. And by the wild animals, chapter 8, verse 18, Lamante da, you will know that I am Hashem amidst the land. When the hail falls, you will know that there's no one like me in the entire land. And Pharaoh learns about faith. And Pharaoh learns about prayer. And Pharaoh learns about the concept of reward and punishment. He tells Moshe, pray for me. Pray to Hashem and have the fraud removed. Pray to me again, chapter 8, verse 24. He develops humility. He almost repents. He acknowledges, this is chapter 9, I have sinned. Hashem is the righteous one, and me and my nation are the wicked ones. Chapter 10, this is Netri's parasha. I have sinned to Hashem your God and to you, and forgive me. This is an amazing thing here. You know, Pharaoh begins his storyline of the Torah, and he's pompous, and he's arrogant. He doesn't believe who was God, why should I listen to him, I won't send the people. And over the course of the story, he develops an act for prayer. He recognizes the justice of the divine punishment. He understands the concept of reward and punishment. He sets the people free. He develops faith. He develops subjugation to God. The whole story, our whole parasha, in effect, is a comprehensive education, spiritual education, of Pharaoh. So this raises almost the opposite question that we had originally. We wondered, how does the nation, the Jewish people, how do they go from being in the depths, from being just absolutely wallowing in misery, unable to hear any messages of salvation? How do they go from there to Sinai so fast? And that story is not told in the Torah. And yet we do see Pharaoh, the villain, that essentially doesn't really matter for the rest of the narrative, we do see his education and his transformation. What is going on over here? So I want to speculate the following. There is an interesting teaching found in Avastor of Nassim, chapter 33. That's also hinted to elsewhere in Jewish literature. And it's talking about the idea of 10. We mentioned this, I think, in the rebroadcast podcast as well. There's, of course, 10 tests that Abram has, and there's 10 utterances of Genesis, and there's the 10 commandments we'll read about in a couple of weeks, the 10 plagues. And this citation in the Avastor Renaissance connects it all. And he says, because Abraham triumphed in the 10 tests, as a result of that, in the merit of that, the Almighty made 10 miracles for his children, for his descendants in Egypt. And corresponding to that, the Almighty also brought about 10 plagues against the oppressors of the Jewish people in Egypt. And also corresponding to that, we have the 10 miracles that were done to the Jewish people at the sea. And also corresponding to that, we have the 10 plagues that were brought upon the Egyptians also at the sea. So we always talk about the 10 plagues that happened in Egypt, 10 plagues that the Almighty brought upon the Egyptians. Here, in this Midrash, we find out that there's more than just 10 plagues in Egypt. There's 10 plagues for the Egyptians, but there's also 10 miracles for the Jews. Concurrent with the 10 plagues for the Egyptians in Egypt, there are 10 miracles for the Jews also in Egypt. 
And then the Exodus happens. And seven days after the Exodus, the Jewish people are by the sea and they're surrounded by Pharaoh who chases them down. And again, there's 10 plagues that befall the Egyptians at the sea outside of Egypt. And there's 10 concurrent miracles that the Jewish people experience at the Sea of Reeds. Something happened to the Egyptians. They experienced 10 plagues twice, 10 in Egypt, 10 at the sea. And something else happened to the Jews. They underwent, they experienced 10 miracles also twice, 10 in Egypt and 10 at the sea. So, of course, this raises some interesting side questions. You know, what are these 10 plagues at the sea? And if you remember the Passover Haggadah, we talk about all kinds of miracles and plagues that befell the Egyptians at the sea, even though they're not spelled out. We talk about 50 plagues according to one opinion, 200, 250 according to other opinions. So we have 40 events ostensibly described here in this Midrash, and it's not so clear what exactly these are. We only know of, or at least scripture only spells out the 10 plagues for the Egyptians in Egypt. The 10 miracles for the Jews in Egypt, the 10 miracles for the Jews at the sea, the 10 plagues for the Egyptians at the sea, that is really not highlighted by scripture. But what is the nature of the 10 miracles that the Jewish people underwent, that they experienced in Egypt? Like we mentioned earlier, what happened to the Jews in Egypt is really not told to us. So here's the insight. The Rambam, in his comment to Perky Avos that talks about this same subject, he tells us what the ten miracles that happened to the Jewish people were in Egypt. And he says the following. The ten miracles that the Jewish people experienced in Egypt, that's not something different than the ten plagues. It's not like there were 20 things that the Almighty did in Egypt. The Almighty did only 10 things in Egypt. But those same 10 things were experienced by the Egyptians as plagues because these befell them, this struck at them, this punished them in 10 different ways. And for the Jewish people, those same 10 events that were plagues for the Egyptians, they are miracles for the Jewish people because the Jewish people were spared from those plagues. So only 10 things happened in Egypt. For the Egyptians, they were plagues. And those same 10 things for the Jews were miracles. So here's what I think is being conveyed over here. 10 earth-shattering, miraculous, out-of-the-ordinary, supernatural things happened in Egypt. And they were experienced by the Jews and their Egyptian neighbors, and by Pharaoh, of course, in opposite ways. For the Egyptians, it was a plague, ten plagues. For the Jews, those same things were experienced on the flip side as miracles. We were saved from it. I think we can suggest, I think what this is actually telling us is, this was an education of both Pharaoh and the Jewish people. Both groups, both cohorts, the Jews who experienced miracles and the Egyptians who experienced plagues, both of them drew powerful lessons from what they encountered. They learned about faith, about subjugation to God, about reward and punishment, about accepting divine punishment, about an inclination for prayer and the power and potency of prayer. The Jews and the Egyptians achieved their faith concurrently via opposite means. What I think this Midrash is suggesting is that there are two ways to achieve the same end, via plagues or via miracles. Everyone was educated, the Jews, the Egyptians. The only difference is... How did this happen? For the Jews, they learned the same lessons and they underwent the same spiritual transformations as the Egyptians via miracles. And for the Egyptians, they experienced the plague side of this divine intervention and that too brought about education, but via a very painful experience. 
So let's take this idea a step further. So there's plagues and miracles, or plagues slash miracles, in Egypt. And there are ten more plagues slash miracles at the sea. So we have this comprehensive education of the Jewish people and of the Egyptians in Egypt. But apparently, evidently, there's still a need to have ten more plagues slash miracles at the sea. The education that happened in Egypt was insufficient, was incomplete. And indeed, we see that the Egyptians, even though they sent the Jewish people, they learned all about prayer and they learned all about humility and Pharaoh proclaimed, I'm the guilty one, I'm going to send you out. Well, what happened a couple of days later? He tells his people, we sent the Israelites out of here, we're crazy, let's go chase him down. Clearly, these are people that their education didn't really stick. They reverted back to the way they were previously, and they pursued the Jews. They chased them down to try to recoup them. Maybe the faith education in Egypt was insufficient. And the Jewish people as well, they received this comprehensive education, but when they're surrounded by the Egyptians, they don't rely on God. They're terrified. And they tell Moshe, what did you do? Why did you take us out? Are there insufficient graves in Egypt, chapter 14, verse 11? You should have let us stay there. Moreover, even after the sea splits and the Jewish people walking in dry land and the Egyptians are being swamped by the waters, the Talmud tells us that the angels had a problem with this. And they said, Halalu of Devodazara, Vahalalu of Devodazara. These and these, i.e., the Jews who are being saved and the Egyptians who are being swamped, they're both idolaters. In the estimation of the angels, these two peoples are indistinguishable. And why are some being saved and some being drowned? Again, we see even after the ten miracles in Egypt that our nation experienced, they're still a nation of idolaters. Clearly, even after the ten miracles in Egypt, there was work to be done outside of Egypt. There were ten more miracles the Jewish people needed until they were ready. What happened in Egypt, those ten miracles, that's partial faith, partial education, and only at the sea with the second round of ten miracles slash plagues, only then was the deal done Only then did they have the exultant song of the sea and did they begin this process of achieving readiness for Sinai. So I think there's maybe two interesting insights that we could take from this framework. Number one, the Jews and Egyptians had concurrent revelations. The plagues, 10 in Egypt, 10 at the sea, educated the Egyptians And those same plagues were experienced as miracles, 10 in Egypt, 10 at the sea, for the Jewish people, and that too educated the Jewish people. But the education in Egypt was insufficient for both of them and had to be completed at the sea, outside of Egypt. So what are the lessons from this construct, from this architecture? I think there's at least two lessons that we could draw. First of all, I think it shows us that there is a dual nature of transformation. The Jewish people were idolaters. And idolaters, well, they're not good candidates to experience Sinai. They can't get the Torah at Sinai, have national revelation at Sinai. They're just not qualified for that experience. So we have to solve those problems before Sinai can actually happen. And here we discover that it has to be solved, so to speak, on two fronts. It has to be solved in Egypt with the 10 miracles in Egypt. It has to be solved outside of Egypt with the 10 miracles at the sea. Perhaps we can say that we have to solve the problem structurally and only then must we address the bad habit. Let me explain. The Jews were idolaters. They behaved like their Egyptian neighbors. Why were they idolaters? There's two reasons, perhaps. Number one, they were in Egypt. They were living amongst the pagans. And of course, they were influenced 
They were subjugated. They were enslaved. And they followed the ways of their Egyptian overlords. The Egyptians are idolaters. The Jewish people followed suit. That's the first reason why the Jewish people were idolaters. But there was a second reason. And that is that they developed habits. After being subjected to the Egyptians for so long, they've been there for hundreds of years. They become acculturated and they develop bad idolatrous habits. And therefore, the redemption, which is supposed to prepare them for Sinai, make them worthy of experiencing that transformational, transcendental experience of prophecy at the foot of the mountain, well, that has to address both reasons why the Jewish people are idolaters. And therefore, we have to first address their subjugation to the Egyptians. And with 10 plagues slash miracles, the Jewish subjugation to their Egyptian overlords is severed. The situation, the environment that depressed them spiritually and caused them to become idolaters, that was remedied in Egypt. And each plague freed them from the shackles of the Egyptians a bit more. And slowly, the structural problem, the systemic problem of idolatry has been solved. And they leave Egypt. But something lingers. Some of these bad habits lingers. Even though the cause goes away, some of the symptoms remain. Even after the Exodus, some bad Egyptian tendencies, they were a bit hard to shake off. So the Almighty makes that the Egyptians chase the Jewish people. We're going to have the 10 miracles slash plagues 2.0. And indeed, by the spring of the sea, the angels, they're exclaiming to God, wait a minute. They are behaviorally identical. They've left Egypt. They've had the Exodus. But there's some vestigial Egyptian behavior that's stuck. Why are you saving the Jews and crushing the Egyptians? And of course, the angels are right. It's an accurate assessment of their current state. But the difference is that now, after the Exodus happened, after we've had a whole year of plagues that have untangled the Jews from their Egyptian masters, now the situation's changed. Their environment has changed. They're free of their Egyptian masters, and now they are in an environment that exudes holiness. And now, in one experience, ten plagues slash miracles all at once could stamp out those bad habits. And now, via the ten miracles slash plagues at the sea, the bad habits melted away. I think this gives us a powerful lesson, or at least a framework for fixing bad habits and bad tendencies. Changing bad habits requires two different elements. Number one, we have to address the cause, the structure, the system of the bad habits, the system that promoted it and encouraged the bad behavior. And then when the situation is no longer conducive to that bad habit, you could easily address the habit itself and try to stamp it out. If you try to address the symptom without trying to address the underlying cause of a problem, well, that's going to be maddeningly difficult because the cause is still there. And maybe you can finesse your way towards overcoming the symptoms, but that will result in a perpetual state of conflict and it won't be resolved. You address the cause first, and once the cause goes away, there's no engine driving those symptoms, and then it's much easier to address the symptoms themselves. You have only 50 days from the Exodus, and the nation that, I guess, 43 days prior, they're assessed by the angels, this is a nation of idolaters. Where are they? They're worthy to be standing at the foot of the mountain and experiencing national prophecy. It turns out that the bad habits themselves, it's actually not what makes them so sticky and so notoriously difficult to free ourselves from. It's the environment that promotes these bad habits. It's the structural cause of these bad habits. It's the system that encourages it. And hundreds of years of learned behavior in Egypt, once we have a whole year of plagues 
trying to separate the two, made the Jewish people a distinct entity, separate from their Egyptian overlords, and they're out of Egypt? Well, then all that learned behavior, once it no longer has the cause pushing for it, it's very easy and quickly, once Egypt is in our rare view mirror, to unlearn and to forget and to banish all those bad habits of Egypt. I think that's one lesson from from this structure of how the Jewish people became the nation that was transformed from slaves that cannot envision freedom, beginning of our parasha, and of course, quickly leading towards the exodus. Of course, our parasha ends in the middle of the story, and it picks up with the last three of the plates, and that's parasha, but it's one continuous transformation, one ongoing transformation of the nation. How did this happen? Well, we have these plagues and miracles, and both in Egypt and at the sea, and that leads towards a transformation. I think there's another lesson, and this is where I may get into trouble. So I will try to weigh my words carefully. And here's the idea. You tell me if I'm wrong. Send me a fiery email to rebelbenjamin.com. Our central thesis is that the Jews and Pharaoh both received a comprehensive education via 10 plagues slash miracles in Egypt and subsequently via 10 plagues slash miracles at the splitting of the sea. But our Parsha is very Pharaoh-centric. There's barely a focus on the Jews. You would imagine that the story could have been told from the vantage point, from the point of view of the Jewish people who witnessed the suffering of their Egyptian neighbors and the tremendous inspirational lessons of faith and of humility and of love of God and of recognition of divine punishment and, and, and reward and of subjugation to God. You could have imagined that that story was told from the perspective of the Jews. But we're following Pharaoh's storyline and narrative. Everyone is transformed in our parasha, Pharaoh, and that story is told in great detail. And the Jews, their transformation is not really highlighted. So why does our parsha focus on the ten plagues and not so much on the ten miracles that came along with them? So I want to speculate the following. Maybe this is a lesson and a warning, shall we say, for us. Our nation has been awaiting redemption for several millennia. Of course, we believe in the concept of Messiah, a restoration of Jewish hegemony over Israel. We're going to reconstitute the Sanhedrin. We're going to rebuild the temple. This is, of course, part of our prayers, part of our liturgy, part of our national hope and yearning for thousands of years. Rebuild Jerusalem, restore the divinic monarchy. Of course, that's something that we are hoping and yearning for for a long time. But as is evident, and of course something that undergirds the basic concept of change in the Torah, the external circumstance is only a reflection of the internal change. The only way for us to have Messiah is if we are inherently worthy of being that nation. So, for example, the Talmud tells us if the Jewish people collectively, as a nation, we observe Shabbat completely with all the laws, two weeks in a row, right away we have a promise redemption will happen. Again, if we become the nation worthy of redemption, we indeed will receive it. And here we see this first redemption that happened to our people, the Egyptian exodus, which we mentioned earlier as a prototype. It's the blueprint of all future redemptions. So we have to develop the faith and the subjugation to God in order to have the redemption. And here we see the first time that it's done. And now we have learned that there are multiple ways to earn the faith, the credentials, the lessons needed to have the Exodus. There's the Pharaoh way of learning it, and then there's the Jewish way of learning it. There's the Ten Plagues version of this education. And then there's the Ten Miracles way of getting this education. Perhaps the overemphasis on the Pharaoh part of the story, perhaps that's a warning for us that redemption can come in multiple ways 
It had come in the Jewish miraculous way. It had come in the Pharaohitic plagues way. And that's not so good. There's a mind-bending teaching in the Talmud. And you read this teaching and it right away doesn't make sense and it raises all kinds of red flags. It's from the Talmud in Sanhedrin on page 98a. It says the following. Amr Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says, Ein ben David ba, the son of David, i.e. Messiah, will not come only in a generation that's entirely righteous or in a generation that is entirely wicked. When will Messiah come? In a generation that's entirely righteous or a generation that's entirely wicked. So first of all, we're told the concept that we've mentioned a few times already, and that is that it is the nature of, of the piety and the righteousness of the generation that will result in Messiah. But this never made any sense to me. I was always under the impression that for us to be redeemed, well, we have to become worthy of redemption and therefore we have to become righteous. Our kids are always told, every time you do a mitzvah, you are installing another brick on the temple. And God forbid, every time we do a sin, well, then we are demolishing part of this temple. And here we're told that there is a way for the son of David to come. And that's a generation where entirely righteous people, everyone's righteous. Well, that made sense. Messiah will come. But how is it possible to achieve the same goals via opposite inputs? How is it possible that David will come, or the son of David will come in a generation that's entirely wicked? Here's the answer. Pharaoh got plagues and learned the lessons of faith and prayer and submission to God. The Jews got miracles and they learned the same thing. Here's the lesson of the Talmud. We will be redeemed. That part is fixed. That part is immutable. It's foretold in the prophecies. It definitely will happen. But how it will happen? What is the nature and the circumstances of that redemption? That is up to us. And here's where I'm going to get into some dangerous territory. The state of Israel. We have a state. Is that amazing? Is that incredible? After 1900 years, there is Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel. Amazing. Well, if I told you that, you know, a few hundred years ago, there's going to be a Jewish state in Palestine in the land of Israel, in Eretz Israel, you would say, well, that's expected. Look at the prophecies. The prophecies talk about the Jewish people coming back to the land and once again making the land bloom. The land that is going to be desolate when the Jews are not there is going to once again flower and flourish once the Jewish people get there. That's expected. But how did we get it? Is it reasonable to say that we had to endure the worst suffering any people have ever experienced in order to get it. You can make an argument that the way we got it almost necessitated the worst genocide in all of human history. Of course, I would imagine, we could have gotten it in a more perhaps pleasant way. It seems like to me that with respect to the state of Israel, we got redemption but we got it in the Pharaohitic version. We got it via the Ten Plagues, not via the Ten Miracles. And now we are awaiting another redemption. And every year we read Pharaoh's story and Pharaoh's comprehensive education. And perhaps we could read it as somewhat of a warning. The Torah is showing us one side of the education and training That's happening here, the side of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh. There were ten plagues. And these plagues taught Pharaoh and the Egyptians many lessons. But what was their result? They were left in an absolute dreadful state. And that's a warning for us. We too can have a Pharaohitic redemption. We too can have the son of David come in a generation that's entirely wicked. And that's pretty awful. And that's pretty terrible. 
And therefore, perhaps we can read our Parsha as somewhat of a warning that we ought to do whatever we can to have the son of David arrive because of our deeds in a generation that's entirely righteous and not despite of them and not in a generation that's entirely wicked and not via the pharaohitic method of redemption via the ten plagues that are very educational. Okay, let us begin this week's drum roll, please. A and Q. Now, A and Q, if this is the first time you're listening, A and Q stands for answers and questions, the opposite of Q&A. Q&A, the audience presents the presenter a question. But in A and Q, which is what we do on the Parsha podcast, A and Q, I, the presenter, ask you a question. And you are encouraged to try to think of a response. And here is this week's question. If you have an answer, send me an email, rabbalbajima.com. Moshe and Aaron are central characters in the story of the redemption. And of course, last week we meet Moshe and Aaron when they go to Pharaoh. Of course, the story follows Moshe and then he reunites with his brother Aaron. And they go to Pharaoh and the first attempt at trying to gain the release of the Jews is a failure. They come to Pharaoh and they tell Pharaoh, let us go. We want to go worship God. And Pharaoh says, what are you doing? Who's God? Why should I listen to them? I'm going to make it worse for you. And Moshe, at the end of last week's Parsha, and the Parsha Shmos, goes back to God and says, why'd you do this to me? You told me that I'm going to go help save the Jewish people. Instead of saving them, it got even worse for them. The things worsened. Their situation deteriorated. And our Parsha begins several months later, and the Almighty once again approaches Moshe and makes another pitch, go back to the Jews, go back to Pharaoh. We're going to try this again. We're going to have a redux. So Moshe goes to the Jewish people and they don't listen to him because they're working so hard because he made things worse for them, really, because now they don't have the the straw to make the bricks and they can't even hear him. And now God says, okay, now it's time to go to Pharaoh. But then there is a little bit of a segue, a little bit of a sidebar where Moshe and Aaron are formally introduced. We don't know who Moshe is in last week's parasha because it just tells us there was a man from the house of Levi who married a woman from the house of Levi and had a son and that's Moshe. And Moshe's brother, Aaron. But we don't know the identities and the background, the pedigree of Moshe and Aaron. And now when they're about to go to Pharaoh a second time, now they're introduced. Who are these people, Moshe and Aaron? Well, the father is Amram. And he comes from the family of Kahas, the son of Levi. And we're told the whole storyline, the whole pedigree, the whole background of Moshe and Aaron. We're introducing these people formally because they have very important roles to play. And the question is like this. Moshe and Aaron already made an appearance last week's parasha. Doesn't it make more sense? If we're introducing characters who have an important role to play in the story, and obviously the Torah believes that we have to know who these people are, we have to get to know their pedigree, why does it not give us their pedigree? Last week's parasha, that's when they started their mission. They went to the Jewish people, they convinced them, they did the miracles, they went to Pharaoh, they also did miracles in front of him, and they spoke to him. It didn't really work out. They tried again this week's parasha. Doesn't it make more sense? Isn't it more natural to reveal the identity and the background and the pedigree of Moshe and Aaron when they're introduced, and when their storyline begins, but apparently the Torah doesn't believe so. The Torah says, no, let's just introduce these people anonymously. We won't tell you who their parents are. We won't tell you what their upbringing, so to speak, is, what their background and pedigree is. And they have the first aborted, essentially, mission. And then they do it again. They go back to Pharaoh, and they go back to the Jewish people. But wait a minute, who are these people? Well, let's talk about their family. First, we're talking about Reuven, Shimon, Levi, all the children of Levi. And then and then Amram, and Amram married Yocheved, and they had a bunch of children, Aaron and Moshe. And these are Moshe and Aaron who are going to Pharaoh. Give me the pedigree at the beginning. Why do you jump in in middle of their story, in middle of their mission? And only now are you telling me who these people are. If you have an answer, send me an email, rabbiwobi at gmail.com. Okay, let's get to last week's question. Now, when I asked the question last week, I was so sure 
that this week I would be able to gleefully tell everyone on the podcast I got no answers and we have no idea what the answer is. And I'm sorry and I hate to disappoint, but we have to wait till next year. We have to think about it for a whole year before we can get the answer. That's what I was planning. And I was going to say, you see, I don't have an answer. No one else has an answer. We're just stumped by this question. And I'm sorry, we'll just have to leave it at that. That was my plan. But as usual, I was bailed out by the incredible Parsha podcast family. And I think I'm going to do this more often. I'm going to find all these questions that I don't have answers to. And I'm going to present them to the audience. And boom, let the answers roll in. So here was the question last week, just quick, quickly. The question was, there are two people in the Torah who lose the priesthood. Reuven loses it because he tampers with his father's bedroom arrangements. And Moshe loses it when he accuses, essentially, Aaron of being envious. And that's why he wants Aaron to go and not him. And because of that, Aaron, who was slated to be a Levi, Aaron becomes the Kohen and Moshe is demoted to become a Levi. And the question is, what's the connection between Ruvain's loss of priesthood and Moses' loss of priesthood? So I got a bunch of answers, incredible answers, of course, from the amazing Parsha podcast family. But one idea that kept coming up in a lot of the answers is as follows. What is the job of a Kohen? The Kohen is like an intermediary, a go-between between the Almighty and the Jewish people. The Jewish people have prayers. The Jewish people have sacrifices. And the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, and the priests in general, they elevate that to God. It's the message of the Jewish people and bring it before God. Moreover, they take the blessing of God and they deliver it to the Jewish people below. So the Kohen is the ally and the fiduciary of the Jewish people, lobbying on their behalf, praying for them, taking care of them, acting for their betterment. And here, Moshe and Ruvain both seem to be doing the same thing, but it's a little bit off. Ruvain is trying to act for the betterment of his mother, of Leah, that she shouldn't be offended, but he does it in a problematic fashion. So he acts like a coin, but not quite Perfectly. Moshe, same thing. He is trying to, so to speak, act for the benefit of his brother, of Aaron. But by doing that, he indirectly offends him by accusing him of being envious. So we see that they have almost the characteristics of a Kohen, but not quite. A Kohen has to be someone who is able to facilitate peace and harmony between everyone involved to be that perfect go-between that's able to arbitrate and make sure that everyone's happy, but in a way that no one gets offended, no one gets trampled upon. My friend Adam wrote the following. I want to read it because it was written so nicely, and he really explains that day really nicely. And of course, I want to point out that there were others who also submitted the same kind of idea, but I want to read this because I really liked how he wrote it. The connection between Moshe and Ruvain is that both of them acted on behalf of someone else. But unlike Aaron, who acted on behalf of others to successfully enhance and fix relationships, Moshe and Ruvain act in a way that they actually created schism. It seems that Aaron was able to understand all sides of the issue and thus how to help all parties come away happy and content with the outcome. On the other hand, both Ruvain and Moshe were only able to have a partial grasp of the feelings and desires of all involved such that the actions they took were indicative of only a partial understanding, and thus there was discontent with the outcome. I thought that was an excellent insight, and we thank Adam, and of course, all of y'all who submitted answers. Thank you for participating in this week's, or really in last week's A&Q, and if you want to participate in this week's A&Q, send me an email, rabbojima.com. Until next week, coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, my name is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. Have an amazing Shabbos and take care.